We have a very interesting seminar that we've pulled together for today. It's a seminar on the science and law of electronically stored information and e-discovery in civil cases. We wanted to fashion a seminar which was different from those we've done in the past, which relates principally to the law of e-discovery, uh, something perhaps that you might be more familiar with. And we prefer to, um, for this particular seminar, take more of a deep dive into the science for ESI. Uh, it seemed that there was a need amongst members of the bar and candidly members of the judiciary to explore um, uh, what the, uh, um, uh, the critical components are of ESI. And we are thrilled to have a highly distinguished panel with us here today to that end. Uh, first, I'll introduce my uh, colleague, the esteemed Judge Mina Kripalani, who is an Associate Justice of the Superior Court. Prior to Judge Kripalani's appointment in 2010, he specialized for over 30 years in complex tort litigation defense at Parker Coulter, Peabody and Arnold, as well as Wilson and Elser. He's a graduate of UVA Law School. Uh, Judge Carpolani is co-chair of our Superior Court's Integrated Technology Governance Committee. He's a former Raj Regional Administrative Justice for uh, Middlesex County and currently presides over our mass torts litigation, uh, which involves over 7,000 consolidated products liability cases. Uh, when we in the Superior Court look to our colleagues for information pertaining to ESI and e-discovery, we always go to Judge Carpolani. We're thrilled that he's here. You'll note, and I'm sure he'll speak about um, his materials in the book, which while not terribly lengthy, um, are comprehensive, and as comprehensive a tome as there is relative to the law pertaining to e-discovery and ESI in Massachusetts. And I commend to your attention in particular uh, the cases which have been cited in Judge Carpolani's materials that are found in the handout which you have. We're also thrilled to have us with us today, and might I simply say that everyone's bios are in the book, so I would direct them to your attention. I'll simply offer a synopsis. We're thrilled to have attorney Shannon Capone Kirk, who is e-discovery counsel over at Ropes and Gray, where she focuses exclusively on e-discovery law. And Shannon is a contributing author on three books on e-discovery, the most recent of which being the EDI Judge's Guide to e-discovery. Shannon has published numerous articles on the topic in publications and has been interviewed by major media on technology, including an NPR affiliate. Shannon was a professor of e-discovery at Suffolk Law here in Boston for several years and in 2017, most notably, was named to the faculty of EDI at Duke's, uh, Duke Law School's renowned e-discovery joint educational program. As I have educated myself relative to e-discovery and ESI, uh, I have found that the Sedona Conference Working Group is the uh, principal group which uh, uh, considers issues pertaining to ESI and e-discovery, if not nationally, internationally, and it is most notable that Shannon is a member of that working group. I would commend to you that you uh, Google the Sedona Conference Working Group. There's some wonderful articles that they have published. I found them to have tremendous practical utility as I consider various matters pertaining to e-discovery in the Superior Court. We're also joined by one of my colleagues from Western Massachusetts, or as we like to call it, West Mass, uh, Attorney Andrew Levchuk. And Andy opened up his own practice recently in Amherst, here in, uh, in Western Massachusetts, that is, where he focuses his practice on civil litigation, white collar criminal defense, and advising clients on cybersecurity, security, excuse me, data protection and privacy rights. And he received his JD from New York University of Law and his BA in mathematics from University of Chicago. He is a certified information system security professional. Before entering private practice, and he was in practice with the Springfield and Boston firm of Bulkley Richardson. Most notably, he spent 24 years at the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, where he tried cases across the country. Uh, he served as senior counsel with the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section and prosecuted data breaches and worked on policy issues. And we are very pleased to have with us today our two experts. First, Jessica Block from Ankara in D.C., 
Jessica is a senior managing director at Ankara based in DC and co-leads the firm's data governance practice. She has more than 15 years experience working with companies and counsel facing complex information management challenges. She has led efforts across the uh, the life cycle of many complex and data intensive litigations, investigations, and transactions. And she has also assisted companies with augmenting their compliance investigation processes through the deployment of advanced technologies and workflows. Before joining Ankara in 2016, Jessica was a senior managing director at FTI Consulting. Jessica's Professional experience includes multinational anti-bribery, anti-corruption investigations, Gulf oil spill investigations, SEC DOJ investigations, and she earned her bachelor's degree from Yale University. She too is a member of the Sedona Conference Working Group on Data Security and Data Privacy. And we are thrilled to have us from San Francisco, from Ernst & Young's office in the Bay Area, Arpit Bothra. Arpit is a senior manager at Ernst & Young in the Forensic and Integrity Services Department. He leads EY's Forensic Technology and Discovery Services practices in the Bay Area and specializes in e-discovery and forensic data analytics. He has more than 10 years of experience around delivering and managing forensic data analytics, e-discovery, and information governance engagements for EY's clients. Our Pete specializes in utilizing emerging technologies and big data to better detect fraud, improve compliance monitoring, and realize operational efficiencies. He's led investigations and in proactive matters for several of EY's largest clients and has led projects throughout the electronic discovery life cycle. So as you can see, we have put together a very distinguished panel of experts in the field of ESI and e-discovery. I want to in particular uh, thank uh, our Pete and Jessica who traveled from quite afar for purposes of uh, this conference. We greatly appreciate all their um, efforts in, um, uh, in educating us today. So what is electronic discovery? What is uh, electronically stored information commonly referred to as ESI? Well, ESI comprises many things, most commonly emails, text messages, social media, electronic files, PDF files, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, video surveillance, photographs, audio files, metadata, the cloud, Wi-Fi and web browsing history, text and telephone call logs, voicemail, geolocation data, chat information, calendars, notes, bookmarks, blogs, application data, and contacts, and SIM card data, just to name a few. In sum, ESI refers to almost everything that our lives in 2019 touches upon, and perforce almost all the discovery that we see now before us, not just in the Superior Court, but the other trial court departments. And so it is pivotally important that we understand the science underlying ESI. And so for that, I'm now going to turn to our panelists for a uh, discussion, and uh, most in particular to um, our Pete and Jessica for a discussion of understanding ESI. So. Do we, can we maybe push the slideshow button there so we can see oh, this yeah. whole slide? I think it, uh, just do it right there to make it easier for y'all to see. Um, at the top ribbon where it says slideshow. Um, all the way at the top in the middle, it says slideshow. Yeah. There you go. There you go. From beginning. Or we could just close that X out of that outline. Yeah, excellent, all right. Technologists and lawyers in cooperation. Um, so how many of y'all have seen this particular slide model diagram before? Okay, so there's, there's a couple out there. So what this is is um, basically a way of thinking about the entire process of taking electronically stored information out of its home environs, wherever that is within the corporation, within a plaintiff's computer, and um, subjecting it to various stages, processes, types of searches, so that 
the attorney's concern can find the specific information, transform it into a format that is compatible for the receiving party, and deliver that information ultimately just what is relevant, non-privileged, et cetera, et cetera, depending on your objectives during the review. So in the e-discovery world, we look to this a lot to kind of break down the various tasks associated with getting started on an e-discovery exercise. So I'll kind of start into the process of identification, and Shannon and Arpit, you guys can jump in whenever to add color, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. So at the far left side, you'll see a couple of stages in this life cycle, information management and identification. So you can think of information management as everything that happens to electronically stored information in the normal course of using that data within an enterprise. So this is how your email systems are stored, how your, your file servers are stored, depending on um, the, the different types of information that you're interacting with day to day, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, depending on the type of enterprise that you or your clients might be working within. There are different rules and policies and mechanisms of storing that information that can have an impact on how easy or hard it is to harvest that information and look through it, turn it over in response to a discovery request or an information demand. A lot of the time, I get involved with clients, with attorneys, when um, a dispute or an investigation or any other information demand has come up. Um, and we are working to identify all of the relevant ESI within the enterprise. Shannon, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what is, what's the 90% of what this is mm -hmm. in terms of your practice? Sure, yeah. I would say that 90% of my practice around identification of relevant information is obviously still e -com, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever is electronic communications, whether it's email, obviously, text messaging, IM, WeChat, et cetera, and we'll talk some more about that. But what I want to talk about, since we're talking about identification right now, and we're talking about the science and the technology of e-discovery, um, is, is I want to address head on this, I think, misconception within the law that sometimes I think uh, puts us at loggerheads on the different sides of the V. And that is, how much do litigators really have to know about technology? Right? What are you going to get sanctioned for when you walk into a Massachusetts court because you are not up to speed on technology? And I think people get a little um, concerned or confused by that. And they, they turn it off and they walk away from it. And I've seen it happen quite a bit. I've actually had litigators in Massachusetts say to me, I don't have to know about any of that e-discovery stuff because we practice in state court. And I'm sure the judges don't agree with that sentiment. So what is it that, that I think practitioners really do need to know? Do you have to go to computer school? No. Do you have to know how a database works? These two will talk to you about some fundamentals there. No, you don't. But there are some things that I think there is a layer of technology and science that I do think practitioners and courts and clerks and judges should have some basic fundamental knowledge about. When I used to teach at Suffolk Law, anybody here go to Suffolk Law? My fellows. Um, you didn't take my class. I would remember you guys. Okay. Um, I used to actually spend about an hour and 45 minutes talking about just email. We're not going to talk about just email for an hour and 45 minutes <laughs> today. But I used to break down the data sources in what I would call two major buckets. And I would say to the students, your final exam will be the most amount of technology that I think you, as a practitioner, have to know yourself. Beyond that, I think you should have to retain an expert, right? And we would talk about custodial data, and we would talk about forensic network data. So the custodial data is probably the 90% of what most cases you have to deal with. And within that, there's the buckets of e -com, which is electronic communications and all of those various iterations. 
And then there's also obviously user-generated data, such as Word and Excel, et cetera, like human-readable stuff. And then if we we're talking about a corporate client, then we're talking about shared platforms like SharePoint and shared network drives. You know, it's all the stuff that humans actually interact with. And then, um, and then you have your network forensic information, which most cases really don't have to get into. And that's where we're talking about log data and server data, et cetera. When we talk about what are the levels of technology and science within this identification realm, and you're talking to a client, and you know that e-com is going to be big in it, right? A lot of times a client will put their IT person on and they'll say, don't worry about it, we, um, we have an exchange and we're archiving everything. So I would present this sort of hypothetical, which actually happens to me all the time, to the students. And I would say, is that good? Is that enough? Are we done? We're done with preservation and identification because they said, don't worry about it, we have exchange and we're archiving everything. And some of the students, you know, you would think like, yeah, well, the IT guy said we're cool, right? They're archiving everything. We're done. And I'm like, well, do you even know what they mean by exchange? Do you even know what that means? No. So, so there's certain sort of common nomenclature amongst IT that are really pretty prevalent within, within most corporations, within most clients. All exchange is, and by the way, I did used to put this on the test, um, is really Microsoft Outlook. And how many here use Microsoft Outlook? Okay, it's, it's the most common. So do I think practitioners and courts should have some technological knowledge about Exchange and Microsoft Outlook? I, yeah, I do. I think that that's a level of knowledge you should have because it's the most common. There's also, there used to be Lotus Notes, but most of the time people don't, that's not really common. Do I think you should know the ins and outs of Lotus Notes? No, I don't. Gmail, Google, all of that, those are there too. And so you probably should have some level of knowledge about that. The next question then is, okay, well we've got, we know that we're using email, we know that we're using Exchange. Do we know if they're using it in the cloud? Or is it on-prem? or enterprise. Those are some words, some technological words that I think you should know the difference between. What, it, what would you say if about on-prem versus cloud and having that level of knowledge? Yeah, I mean, I think having that knowledge, not just from a perspective of where is the data stored, because from a privacy standpoint, I think that can make some determination of how things move forward. But just from a technology standpoint, if it's on the cloud, that means they're using O365. That's another term you use as people start migrating to the cloud. That's Office 365. That's on the cloud. The types of settings that are available on the cloud versus on-prem are very different. And, and what that means for things like litigation hold, for things like archiving, for things like having the ability to if someone deletes an email from their Outlook, can it or cannot be recovered, right? So, so a lot of these things, as you go towards I, from identification into when you actually start doing the processing, understanding whether it's on the cloud, on-prem, and just some of the settings that have been historically enabled can really give you an idea of what are the effects of that downstream as you go towards processing the data and then eventually having it available for review. Uh, one, yeah, just one thing I, I would add, I, I mean, I think just to reemphasize what's been said is um, that the ABA standards now require you to have a basic understanding of any technology that, you know, is used on a regular basis in your cases. The August 2012 amendments to the model rules of professional conduct require you uh, to have sort of a basic familiarity with the terms. Um, you know, I started my practice back in the 1980s. Uh, I was at a firm called Guest and Snow, which went belly up long before it was fashionable. Um, <laughs> some of you may remember it. Uh, and um, it, um, uh, you know, it was all paper. 
uh, you know, there was almost no electronically stored information except, you know, mainframe databases. So, um, you know, you didn't have to know much. But now, I mean, to really represent your clients effectively, if you don't know the basics of how information is maintained and stored, you can't possibly either prepare good discovery requests or respond appropriately to discovery requests directed to you. So it's really, you know, an, an, an ethical uh, matter as much as anything. So we really have to, we're under an obligation to educate ourselves. And, and I, I would just add too that um, as with all things, um, the way that most people learn this is by asking questions. So the first conversation that you have in this regard where you're scoping out the landscape of everything that might be relevant to a specific information request, it's what data do we have? Where do we have that data? It's stored in this kind of place. What does that mean? Tell me more about that. And I think through that kind of dialogue, you start to, to get more comfortable operating in the environment and you should use those conversations and technical experts and IT folks as sort of a, spa a safe, sounding board in that regard to get comfortable with the ins and outs of, of feeling like you, you at least have a sense of the landscape of information that you're dealing with. So I think, um, I think too, when we're council um, especially, and we're, we're trying to get our arms around a particular client's data sources in this identification phase, we want to triage things. And how I like to direct folks to do this is think of the most ephemeral data first and hit that first and ask the questions as Jessica is, is suggesting about those first and then move down the line to the least ephemeral. So the stuff that's going to be there regardless, right, of, of whether you identify it or preserve it. And I do think that that's a level of technology you should understand. What is the stuff that I should probably ask questions about first? So I started talking about email. That to me is probably one of the first things you want to hit. So if, if, if we find out that we have Microsoft Outlook and it's in the cloud, it's in Microsoft 365, right? Well, then we know that there's settings with that where we can put a litigation hold on custodians. Great, let's do that, get it done. Next, let's hit the next ephemeral stuff. <clears throat> instant messaging, text messaging, et cetera. Getting your arms around that um, and understanding what your client has in those buckets is a little more difficult. Most clients can't control it from the enterprise level, meaning the IT person can't go and preserve it for you. It's gonna have to be usually custodian by custodian. Uh, I'm gonna ask when I'm done talking, Jess and or Arpit to talk about e-com apps such as we, WeChat and WhatsApp and the difficulty in ensuring preservation around that. Next, we would want to then talk about, now we're getting into areas where we're less concerned about immediate action, right? And that's when we're talking about laptops and desktops and you know, other network saved information. If you're representing an individual human being outside of a corporation, right, then it's still sort of the same triage. You're going to want to talk to them about their phone with their text messaging and their email and then their own personal computer, et cetera. Then when we start getting into the least ephemeral items, the um, databases, such as financial databases, I know Jess does a lot of work around that, and so does ARPIT, that's when I as counsel know to ask questions around very basic things, such as what kind of information is in there and do I think that's relevant? Beyond that, though, understanding how that database works, understanding what tables and indices mean, understanding what access logs mean and all of that for particular databases, that's when I start to get out of my comfort zone, right? That's where I sort of think, okay, I'm, I'm at the threshold of my understanding of technology. I'm going to bring in probably an expert at this point to help me understand what, a, what this database is all about, how it functions, and more importantly, 
how I can get information out of it in the least costly and most effective way. So if we were gonna talk about the science and technology around structured databases uh, that, that you typically encounter, how would you go about that? Sure, so in addition to what we typically refer to as unstructured data, and we'll spend a little bit more time on this in a minute. In fact, um, well, if you want to, we can just flip, flip to the next slide and then come back to talk about collection a bit. Can we do that? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, so when you think about all the different data types that we've touched on briefly, Shannon mentioned kind of the 90%. So a lot of the business communications that are going to be relevant for a particular litigation, investigation, discovery response are going to lie in email and other documents that you create, which are typically referred to as unstructured data. Depending on the issues, there could be business information that's contained in other data stores like your accounting records. If it's um, an investigation, financial fraud, or revenue recognition issue, something like that, the actual evidence and the history related to it might not be stored in email or in structured systems. Um, if it is a a case about off-label promotion, you might be looking closely at the notes that your sales reps were taking in the field when they were meeting with doctors selling drugs. Um, and that information, again, might not be c contained in typical formats like email or um, business documents, office documents that you're talking about. When you get into this, these types of information, a lot of different questions around the format of the data structure itself, the format of the application that's used to read it, start to become more relevant. Um, if you think about something basic in your life like a, an iTunes library, which is probably getting even less and less relevant as, as iTunes itself is kind of going away in its current iteration, you can think of the way that you look at the application screen, it displays information to you, you can sort it, you can search it, you can pull up files, but what's happening is there's a database behind that application layer that's storing information about each individual MP4 file or video file that you have, and then there's some other fielded information that gives you specifically structured data like the title of the song, the length of the song, the date that you added it to the database. Um, sometimes that information is more difficult to interact with because it might not be a format that you are familiar with as an attorney, as a practitioner. You might not know how to slice and dice a general ledger. It might be easier for you to interact with because you can ask it questions without subjecting it to additional formatting and manipulation. You can sort your iTunes library and say, just give me everything I added with a title like Superstar. By Ray LaMontagne. <laughs> by Ray LaMontagne, if you're Shannon. Yeah. And then that's your entire library, so yes, that's not a very effective library. search. Um, there, <laughs> there are different challenges that might arise there. Uh, Arpa, do you want to say a little bit more about some of the um, particular things that you've dealt with in the realm of accounting software and GL and ERP? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think as Shannon and Jessica were saying, from a structured data standpoint, all structured data really is, is think of it as an Excel file, right? But there are only specific types of things that can go in each column. So it's a very well-defined source. So here's a date field, there's a particular format I expect, you can only put a date into that metadata field, right? It's not a free-form text box. The minute you have a free-form text box, that turns into an unstructured data source. So structured data source is really the application telling you this is what you can put into this field, and then everything's gonna conform to certain rules. That makes it structured. So, so any of these databases, so if we look at any of the accounting databases, you're gonna have specific fields that say if, for example, you've got an earnings management or a revenue recognition type of situation, what you're really looking for is when was the product shipped? When was it originally asked to be shipped by the customer and did the client kind of cross quarter boundaries in trying to send the product before 
the customer wanted it, leading to an earnings management or, or, or a similar situation. So within the enterprise system, ERP system, there'll be lots of tables, and that's how data is really organized, is by tables. That's really saying all my purchase orders will go into a particular table. All my invoices will go to a separate table, and there's going to be tables for all sorts of information just to keep it organized. But when you want to try to get at that data, what you really want to do is, is not have 100 tables in front of you, because that's really not going to make sense to most people, let alone in, in a case of litigation. Really trying to identify what are the fields that I want from this structured data source, and how can I pick and choose? It's like in Excel, if you had 100 tabs, and each one of them had 20 fields that you cared about, but they were somehow linked with one key, what I want is not to have 20,000 fields. I just want a separate tab that I'm going to create with the 100 fields that I care about. So that then I can run a pivot table on it. I can run a graph on it. I can do whatever analysis you're comfortable with just to make sure was there $100,000 of payments that really should have come in Q2 but came in Q1, right? Because we tried to push the product sooner. So, so from a structured data standpoint, given everything is so well organized, as long as you can understand how things are organized and what rules were put in place, you can extract that information into a format that's going to be helpful to you to really be able to answer the question that you want to ask and then format it in that way for further analysis. But our, oh. Yeah, just one, one question yeah. following up on that. Do you, when you are seeking discovery uh, of the files which will ultimately give you the specific information that you want, do you want everything or do you structure your query uh, simply to get what you want? So you asked it a nicer way. Uh, it's my same question. I was going to say, just give me everything. <laughs> yeah. Just give me the whole database, which is basically what he's asking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so again, it depends on how much you want to know and what is the process you're going to go after, right? When you start interacting with some of the IT people at these corporations, and if you start giving specific requirements of them having to do some manipulation of the data, what you might get back is something very different from what you had actually intended to get. And that's where a lot of these cases go sideways and a lot of frustration comes in on the client, on the council, and everywhere else where we've gone through now a month process where we can't even get the information that we wanted just because we're not talking on the same wavelength. So, so the answer to that is it's always better to limit the collection because you don't want to have a lot of stuff collected because now at some point it becomes discoverable. Right? So you don't want to have too much, but at the same time, you don't want to give that manipulation piece, or, or I shouldn't say manipulation, the formatting piece over to client IT without any control because you might not have control of what you get back, and then it's kind of apples and oranges because you expected one and you got the other. In addressing issues pertaining to extraction and formatting, as you've identified, it appears there's ample opportunity for manipulation, <laughs> uh, particularly when we're dealing with vast amounts of information. And suffice it to say, it would appear that engaging an expert for that purpose uh, would be um, appropriate. But what are some of the telltales that counsel should be looking for in identifying whether or not there's been manipulation? Because how one organizes data um, it will necessarily um, depend upon a certain outcome, I suppose. An outcome will depend upon how one uh, organizes data. So can you comment on that? So, so when we're looking at ERP systems, especially financial records, right, the first thing, if there is any doubt or if there is part that there might be manipulation or we want to make sure that there is no manipulation, the first piece we do is, is take the general ledger, which is essentially the line-by-line -line entry of all accounting, and, and really compare that to the financial records that the company is releasing. Right? So that's kind of like a completeness analysis mm -hmm. where you take the individual journal entries, that's the general ledger, and you roll it up all the way to the financial records, and if it's a publicly traded firm, then you have out financial records that have been published results, and really going through 
uh, and it's it, that's not a very time consuming step, but it's a step where you have to interact with the financial team at the company to understand how that roll up happens because there are various ways of booking certain accounting, but really making sure you can get that completeness analysis from yes, everything is accounted for and what I am getting, it's not that a bunch of transactions have been taken up. Right? So that's the completeness aspect of it. And then the other piece which we always very often run to, most of these ERP systems have access logs and have audit logs. So anytime you change something, that is almost always, unless it was specifically turned on, which is again a red flag, uh, there's access and audit logs. So if the question is asked, can we get the audit log, and you get an answer that says, oh, either that might be too hard to get to, or I don't know if we have those audit logs, that's another thing to watch out for. Because if it is any standard ERP system, again, like I said, unless it's been specifically switched off, audit logs are always there. Could you address? I think. Oh, oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. At some point, if you could address what metadata is and how it is important in analyzing the sort of ESI. So I'm sorry, though, Jessica. Well, it, it, my comment was those are both good questions that I think kind of take us back to thinking about this preservation and collection stage and what are the important considerations and documentation that you might want to have accompany that work. So preservation and, do and collection is generally the process that you go through once you've identified the specific data that's relevant to um, preserving that data to ensure that it, if it's being deleted or overwritten in the normal course of business that you're not losing information, um, that you know, once you have reasonable anticipation of litigation or a need to further investigate that information, that you have it in a format that it's not going to change, and that you have appropriately documented the processes and procedures that you use to make that collection, and you're maintaining a chain of custody. So depending on the type of information that you're collecting, that's going to look differently. So to the point of manipulation with the structured data systems, what you might do is in the process of saying, I need an uh, an extraction of the general ledger. You would actually document the queries, the processes, the work that the IT team did to pull that information out of the system, whether that was a specialized process where they were writing queries against a database, if they were using the application. You would detail all that information so that presumably you could even potentially recreate it if there was some kind of a challenge down the road. Similarly, depending on the situation, and there's sort of a whole range of appropriateness in tactics and tools that you would use that Andy and Shannon might get into in a little bit more nitty-gritty detail, the methodology that you use to make a copy of the data will involve different levels of forensic preservation. So Judge Mason referenced metadata, which is essentially data about data. It's what the file system or the computer knows about the file. Or if you're talking about an, ex an exchange environment, it might be what the exchange environment knows about the particular message. So it might be information like the date that the file was created, the author that's associated with the date. If you're dealing with email messages, you might be talking about the sent date, the subject line, other fielded information that's attached to the, the specific document in question. And there are different tools available to IT departments, to individuals. There are different methodologies that you could use to ensure that you capture that information and that you don't modify it by touching the files once you've created a copy of them. And preservation of that metadata and understanding how to engage in a dialogue with those that are responsible for making the copy, I think, is a really important uh, a really important element of where your duty kind of continues and where you do need to understand a little bit about how to articulate your objectives in the collection so that the right tools are used and the right methodologies are deployed to achieve those forensically sound ends. Well, to make that specific to email, Shannon, you've sued my client. Okay. Uh, you asked me for discovery, you want some emails. I stopped by your office, Shannon. There's nope. the emails. Do it over. Okay, you don't, you don't want my paper. <laughs> no. What, what's wrong with paper? Well, I don't have any metadata. I can't authenticate anything. 
that's just not cool. I can't put it into, it's definitely not cool. Yeah. Um, I can't put it into my review platform, which uh, would help me to sort it and search it, et cetera. So no, I would like you to produce it in TIFF format with extracted text, OCR readable with metadata fields. And the metadata will tell you things like, um, you know, not simply to, from, subject, date, uh, but it will give you much more granular information about the route the email traveled through the internet, uh, where the sender was, where the recipient was, uh, what the actual time was, uh, servers uh, along the route that that email may be uh, residing on, uh, which may have other information that's relevant to your case. Paper will not tell Shannon any of that stuff. So on metadata, if you want me to stick on this sure, just for another sure. second. Thank you. Um, so metadata used to get a lot of play in e-discovery because it was this new thing and we didn't understand it, et cetera. I, I think that we can demystify metadata a little bit. There's a good case out there, and, and I'll, have to, I'll have to send to you, Judge, to distribute everybody. It's just escaping my mind right now. But it's a second, second Circuit case, and it's a great case um, from the Zuba Lake Judge, Judge Shinlin, and, and she calls it the standard metadata fields. And it's really what Andy was just mentioning, the to, from, the file name, et cetera. There's like about 10 of them. And so for most cases, uh, I don't think litigants need to get bent out of shape about debating what metadata fields to agree and don't agree. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty standard. And I would say, you know, I, I, I was a trial attorney for 10 years, and then I've been in e-discovery for 11. And so out of 20-some-odd years, I've had two cases where metadata mattered, uh, two actual litigation cases where they mattered. Now, I've handled investigations, internal investigations, where metadata can absolutely matter when we're talking about internal fraud, et cetera. But if we're talking about civil litigation, it's pretty rare that metadata really comes up. It, it would come up if Andy tried to produce to me paper documents. There's a dispute right there. I'm, I'm going to want it with the metadata. Uh, came up in a case for me where we were suing a former president for misappropriation of trade secrets and, um, and other financial crimes on our company while he was president of that company. And through a very strange series of events, we got electronic documents from his real estate agent. Um, when we looked at the metadata of those documents, for some reason he was trying to prove, I think, he was, I think he was trying to date the real estate agent. But I don't Not know. Not metadata. Not metadata, no. That's a good joke. <laughs> um, so he was trying to impress her with this business plan of this new business he was setting up. And I don't know how we got wind of this real estate agent, but we, we served her with a subpoena. She gave us any emails he'd sent to her. And there was this business plan. And guess what? The metadata was awesome. It proved that he had written that business plan on our company computers on this very critical date. And he had used, uh, the, it showed all the modifications and who had done the modification in the metadata. And it was, you know, it was all of the key C-level people who he absconded with to his new company. So that was a good day. That was a good metadata case. But it's rare. Um, I think that metadata is pretty standard if we're talking about office documents or email, et cetera. And again, if we're talking about a fraud internal investigation kind of case, it really does come into play then. Uh, the one other thing I would add from a metadata standpoint it can lead to a lot of efficiencies downstream from a review standpoint. And, and maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves in review, but if you've got email and, and you know, if you use Gmail or you use Outlook, threading is, is a very, very common thing where I don't want to look through 20 emails if they're just replies to each other. Just give them all at once in context. Metadata is what really helps us put from a technology standpoint, things back together. So if you just received emails, there would be 20 separate emails. 
But if you get the metadata along with it, you can actually chain those and say they're part of one thread so you don't have to encounter them 20 different times in review, assuming all of them were relevant. You're actually seeing them in the right context at the right time. Yeah. Let's talk about processing and review. So, okay. okay, who's reviewed documents in a document review platform? Okay. Some lucky souls here. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody well, use Brainspace? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Um, the, after you've identified the documents, after you've preserved them, after you've worked to collect them, typically what's happening is you're taking that corpus of information and you're subjecting it to some form of processing, which is one of the stages up here. What is basically happening during the processing stage is you're using another kind of software program to look at all the different file types, to pull out all of this metadata that we've been discussing, and to put it into a tool so that you or other attorneys or folks at the company or your client or the court has the opportunity to go through the documents in question in a more ordered way. So what the end result basically looks like is kind of like looking at Outlook itself. You have information about the, the document or the file, and then you have a rendering of the document or the file. Most of them are stored centrally in a hosted data set, so you can access them over the internet from wherever you are, securely, et cetera. There's lots of different tools on the market that do this. Um, there's one that's very dominant right now called Relativity that you will probably encounter at some point unless the software world rises up and <laughs> There's, there's more competitors, but um, it is, it's a similar to Outlook paradigm where you've got a list and then you've got the presentation of a document. Um, you can, usually during the processing stage, and this might be something that you negotiate heavily or not, you can subject the documents to search terms. So this might be something that you are working internally to define to help you guide an investigation. This might be something that's hotly litigated as part of your um, ESI protocol where you're defining a long list of keyword terms. You might not use keyword terms at all. You might subject the documents to some more advanced processing based off of a classifier that you've trained to identify specific types of documents. We can talk more about that or not. Um, but essentially, you're using the technology to winnow down the amount of documents that you need to put eyes on review to make decisions about to turn those documents over. Okay, I'll pause there. I'll let you touch on that a little bit. We're okay, so, so if we were going to talk about science behind processing and all of that and, um, and review, I mean, I, I've, I could talk for three, four days on the review piece of it, but I think we probably... We'll Please don't. That. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, Three to four minutes is okay, though. Yeah. Please don't. <laughs> um, but there, there are some traps, some technological traps, I think, in processing. So much so that at the Georgetown eDiscovery conference this year, which is the the advanced eDiscovery conference, I if you're if you're interested in this, I um, highly recommend going to that, looking into it. It's in November and it's in DC. But we've decided to add to that an entire session on the science behind processing. Um, and, you know, so what is that, right? What is it that we as attorneys, um, court personnel, judges need to know about processing? Well, this is where, this is the sausage making stage, right? You've gone and you've collected gigabytes and gigabytes, sometimes terabytes of data. And you've got to crunch it all up, and what is all that crunching, and put it into a review platform that is human readable and accessible. Um, there's, there's definite traps and questions within processing that, that I still, after all these years, have to rely on my litigation technology team to make sure I get it right, such as what is the time zone we're going to process in, right? Um, you know, are we going to globally dedupe everything? In other words, globally dedupe across all custodians uh, or within custodians, vertically. What are some other more technical traps that you see within that, that processing decision? 
Um, there's a, there is a variety of functionality across different tools that are out there. And a lot of the time, you might rely on a tool to do basic things that don't really have much to do with nitty gritty electronic discovery. And that tool is not sufficient to provide the level of detail. It's making different technological assumptions about which copies of a document are the same or, um, you know, translating a search term for you the way that Google would when you type it in and it says, I think you mean this, you want to see this, whereas in an e-discovery scenario, you want to be more precise with the uh, syntax that you're putting forward so that you can document it and explain it. So there, I, say, I would say that there's the trap of variety. So things, data gets indexed differently. Certain platforms will treat certain words as noise versus not. They might, I had a case where um, it was a Gulf oil, oil spill related case and there was a lot of effort at the beginning to run search terms across these huge amounts of um, productions from various defendants and the government and the technology that we were using treated the word out as a noise word. So if, if, in case you guys remember, the whole, the crux of the Gulf oil spill was about what happened when this blowout preventer failed. So basically, like we spent days running all of these searches that then ultimately someone was like, wait a minute, we're not getting anything back, or we're getting everything back for this term. We're not getting blow out, we're getting every instance of the word blow. So we had to stop and re-index and rerun. And luckily that happened quickly and we were able to iterate on it. But nuances like that could be different across different platforms. So you have to be very precise and you have to be specific about the technology and the syntax and the choices that you're gonna make in that regard. Uh, the one other thing I would add to that is, is the process of extracting text, which is very different depending upon the type of document you're dealing with. So, for example, if you have a Microsoft Word document, that inherently has text within it that you can extract easily. On the flip side, if you have a TIFF file or if you have a PDF that is not text-based, so it's a scanned PDF, a normal text extraction process is not going to get you any of the underlying text. So we run into a lot of cases where we'll run processing, assume all the text has been extracted, but there were a bunch of image-based files that you actually have to run through the process called OCR, that's optical character recognition, that kind of estimates what the text would be because there's really no text within the document. And, and normal OCR, I think most of the applications right now have got that down really well. So you run it through text extraction. If you don't get any text extraction, Let's just run OCR on it and we'll get things back. I think a lot of problems really happen when you have document that's half and half, right? So you have a Word document, but it has an embedded image in there that's off a table, which might be very, very critical for you in terms of being able to run terms or search terms on it. But if you don't run the appropriate processes or you haven't set things up appropriately, you're not going to get that. So, so really, one of the traps that, you know, at least on the technology side that we fall into is making sure you got as much text as you expected. And there's a lot of ways of going about doing that, but really making sure you're looking at the logs associated with it because there's, I mean, that's really the step where you're indexing everything and that's where all your terms run again. So if a few documents get left out, you could run the best search terms or the best predictive models, but those documents are never gonna be hit because the text wasn't appropriately extracted. So that's a very, very important step of making sure you're putting quality control around that. And as you're dealing with uh, the service provider that's doing the processing, really demanding some of those QC reports and, and logs that you can go through that or at least have make sure someone's going through that to get that right at that point. I think too, understanding the business environment that, of the client that you're working with or your company um, or whomever you're representing, if you're dealing with a construction litigation, some of the key documents might be 
file formats that some standard processing tools filter out as not business documents. They don't, they're not Word, PDF, Excel, email, and so it might sort of, as a matter of course, ignore them, treat them like system files, if it's audio or video or CAD drawings. So you have to be attuned to where you expect key evidence to lie and talk to the people that are generating that information. If you're dealing with um, a heavy technical like R&D or pharmaceutical or something like that, understanding um, how the individuals are interacting with the data. So it might be, well, we're keeping all of our submissions to the FDA in this folder, but if you go get that folder, what you're basically getting is a bunch of different files that are typically read by an application or a viewer. And so if you put them through the same process, you would the documents that you keep on your hard drive, the processing tool will separate them and it will be kind of garbage for you to look at. So you need to understand from the individual custodians, and a lot of this happens during the identification phase, what, what are you using to do your work? How do you typically interact with it? Are there special tools or technologies that are a part of this? Because you might need to treat that information differently. Um, and I'd say that that is kind of a common processing trap. And a lot of the time people figure it out very quickly when they say, well, where are all the submissions? Where are all the blueprints? Where are all the, the pictures? Mm -hmm. But it, um, it can be costly, especially because sometimes you need to uh, negotiate different arrangements with respect to how you're even dealing with some of this. Some of it can be very voluminous, and so you might want to exclude or include it at the outset, very large video files, things like that. Although I would say I would hope that you'd be working with an e-discovery vendor who would not allow you to put a whole bunch of CAD drawings into a review Move platform. Your microphone closer. Right? <laughs> Um, I mean, it, you guys tell us if you're if you're representing a general contractor that's involved in a construction dispute, potentially hiring an e-discovery provider may or may not be on the table. So it might be something that you're negotiating a little bit more free form. But I would say yes, in any large scale, if you're using an e-discovery vendor or a technical expert to help you, then they should be guiding you through some of these basic scoping questions, but you certainly could find yourself in a scenario where you're representing somebody, I guess, that just doesn't have that resource available, or you're responding to an information demand from someone that hasn't been specific enough in what they're asking for to sort of help you along in that response. Mm -hmm.